Imagine this is the only civilization currently in the Milky Way galaxy. What does that tell us about our behavior? It should inform our politics. It should inform the way that we treat each other, the way that we behave as a global civilization. I hadn't seen that before. I hadn't seen that link made between knowledge, discovery, scientific exploration, and morality and politics. An interesting question. The first thing to say is that, that I came into uh, public engagement, uh, communicating science, by accident in many ways. I, I was working, I'm sure we'll talk about it, at the Large Hadron Collider at CERN in Geneva, um, which Manchester, along with many universities across the world, played a, a big part in building the detectors there. And I was being a postdoc, doing my research there. And, and the BBC uh, appeared because they were interested in the building of this giant machine and, uh, and interviewed me and sort of liked the way that I spoke and then interviewed me again and then said, would you like to make a small BBC4 programme? BBC4 is a, a smaller channel the BBC have on the Large Hadron Collider. And it sort of snowballed from there. And I'm, I'm often reminded of the, the idea that um, you, you should never be a politician and run a country if that's what you want to do. And it's the same, I think, with, uh, with public understanding or engagement in a way. It's not, it's not something that many people choose to do in my experience. You tend to be a, a researcher and, and you fall into it accidentally. Um, but I think the, the, the best answer to the, the value of public engagement is, is perhaps not to teach people or to tell people about the, the discoveries themselves, you know, the, the age of the universe, 13.8 billion years, the 350 billion galaxies in the observable universe. What, what do you need to know? They're all interesting things, it's entertaining. But ultimately, there's a very famous um, uh, essay which was based on a speech by the Nobel laureate Richard Feynman, so iconic theoretical physicist. I think it was back in 1953 or 1954. And he gave a speech to the American Academy of Sciences called The Value of Science. And so he talked about the fact, of course, that our modern civilization is built on science and engineering. The great discoveries are obviously feed through into everything that we take for granted today, increased life expectancy, whatever it is. But he said, actually, the most valuable thing is what he called the philosophy of science itself. And he called it a satisfactory philosophy of ignorance which I think is a beautiful kind of term. It is merely satisfactory, it's no better than that, and it's a philosophy of being ignorant. And, and what he meant was that, of course, the way that science proceeds is you come up with a, a theory, you look at the world, you try to explain it. Um, you're more, than, more often than not, almost always, as a, uh, certainly a theoretical physicist, you're almost always wrong. You are certainly never absolutely right. Um, you can be temporarily right and approximately right for a while, and then some new data comes along and, and your theory must be refined or indeed jettisoned. And his point was that, that, that it's, a, it's a very humble approach. And it's, it's not often communicated as that, actually. Some, quite often, it seems that scientists are, are priests who sit on top of a mountain and pronounce on the way that we should, the world works and what people should think. Nothing could be further from the truth. That, that idea that, the, that science is a satisfactory philosophy of ignorance, I think, is it's central to the success science has had that explain in the natural world as we see it. But it's also, Feynman points out, um, a, a useful approach to all human endeavour. The, the fact that, that be an absolutist is, is someone who really is... That there's not, that there isn't great value in being an absolute, in believing yourself to be absolutely right, what we might call a Trumpian approach, I suppose, these days. To, that, that, that's, not only is that not the way to discover how nature works, but it's not really the way to, 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 run, um, to run humanity. It, it, so so I, I think that's a very interesting perspective that Feynman had on the value of science. And so we'll, we'll, I suppose most of this talk, we'll talk about what we know about the universe, what we know about particle physics, Higgs particles, etc. But underlying it all is that philosophy of ignorance, which is a valuable thing. <laughs> Thank you.
the, the, the things we talk about now in modern cosmology are almost ridiculous. We, we talk about a universe with 350,000 million galaxies like the Milky Way. Uh, how do we know? How do we count them? We talk about a universe that's 13.8 billion years old. How do we know? How do we make that measurement? So all those, the, the, those, those facts, the precision with which we can describe the, the evolution of the universe from, let's say, less than a billion to the second after the Big Bang, and actually even speculate about what happened before that is quite remarkable. But the, the parallel is, of course, the, the undercurrent is, is how did we know those things? How do we know? How can we speak with confidence of a measurement of the age of the universe? Or indeed, the age of the Earth, or the mass of the Earth, or the mass of the Sun? How were these things done? They, they took, a, they, they took the, the de deploying that philosophy of ignorance, really, they're, they're the fruits of that. So I think what you can see, when you, when you look at our, the precision of our understanding of, of, of worlds beyond our experience, and conditions so far away from human experience, it's almost impossible to see how you could get a handle on it. That same process, um, I think, and, and Feynman thought, and many think, can be deployed in, in for questions, not only direct questions with direct connection to science, like a climate change and what, how, how perhaps we should respond to it and what's the most likely outcome if we carry on, all those things, public health policy, there are obvious areas. But I think that also that, that as I said, that, that deploying that philosophy of ignorance can, can be it, it can be. A, I'd like to say it could be deployed throughout human thought, with, with, with caveats, of course. You don't develop policy necessarily. It's not a logical. You can't just press a button and develop policy. There's obviously opinion in that, but you can measure the effectiveness of policy based on some frame. You see it with. Um, I mean, the, modern cosmology is based on. Einstein's theory of general relativity, which is a theory of gravity. Um, so in that sense, the ambition of the theory was no greater, really, than Newton's. It was to, it was to describe how objects move in, in gravitational fields. Um, Newton um, said, that, that, you know, that it's an apocryphal story, actually, but Newton said there's an apple fell onto his head. Um, why did it fall onto his head? Because there's a force pulling it down, and that force is proportional to the, the product of the mass of the Earth and the mass of the apple and the square of the distance between them. So the, that was the first universal law of nature. 1687, so a great step forward. In 1915, uh, based on uh, thoughts that Einstein had had for actually a decade or more, um, Einstein produces a new theory of gravity, which to the, the summary, the one line summary, is that the apple doesn't hit Newton on the head because the Earth pulls the apple down. Uh, the apple hits Newton on the head, the head because Newton accelerates upwards and headbutts the apple, which was floating there, minding its own business, having become detached from the tree. So it's completely the opposite picture. It's a very counterintuitive picture. Um, Einstein's basic, the, the, the genius of Einstein was to realize what we all see now. If you look at the International Space Station and the astronauts floating in it, we're quite familiar with the fact that although those astronauts can be described as being in free fall, freely falling towards the Earth, it looks for all the world as if no forces are acting on the astronauts at all. So if you're an astronaut, gets a cup of water and lets go of it, then it just stays there. It gets a feather and puts it there, and it stays there. It gets a big one kilogram mass and puts it there, and it stays there. So the thing that Einstein noticed, which is not explained in any way satisfactorily in Newton's theory, is that obvious thing. That, 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 well, it's not that obvious, but it's, uh, it's obvious if you look at astronauts, that all things fall at the same rate in a gravitational field. If you remove air resistance, so you drop a feather and a hammer, it was famously done on Apollo 15, actually, on the moon, drop a feather and a hammer here. If, if, if air resistance is taken away, if there's a vacuum here, they would fall at the same rate. It's an unusual, it's a, that, that's central to the behavior of gravity. Uh, Newton doesn't explain it, really. It, Newton's theory works, but it's rather convoluted. There's no real explanation of that. 
But Einstein's theory, the explanation is that they're not falling. It is the ground that is accelerating up. And these things are just sat there minding their own business. Complete redefinition of the picture. But that led, so that's the ambition, Einstein's ambition. He was interested in that. What, what is, how do I explain that? That led to essentially a geometric theory of gravity, which is that there isn't really a force of gravity at all. What there is, is the curvature of space and time, because he'd already merged those together in 1905. So the, the, the bending or curvature of space and time by mass so you picture the, the, why does the Earth orbit the Sun, according to Einstein? Because the Sun curves space and time in such a way that the straight line, the, the, the path of falling, essentially, around the Sun is actually an orbit. And you might say, well, how is it? How could you replace a, a force with geometry? And actually, there's a beautiful analogy that you can see that. So if you imagine the surface of the Earth, then you imagine standing with your friend at the equator and you, you agree to walk due north, so you set off. Now, the parallel lines on the surface of the Earth are lines of longitude. So what you find is you get closer to your friend as you head to the North Pole, and in fact, if you got to the North Pole, you'd bump into them. So if you didn't know that you were moving on a curved surface, you would conclude there was a force of attraction between you, pulling you together, because you were minding your own business, trying to walk parallel to your friend, but you kept getting closer. You get closer because you're on a curved surface. And that's exactly the way that Einstein's theory works. So that's kind of interesting. And, and that provides the, the kind of explanation in rough terms for why things fall at the same rate in the gravitational field. It's just that they're minding their own business, following the same straight line through the same curved space. So you think, okay, beautiful. Um, it makes some predictions that were better than Newton's. It predicts the orbit of Mercury more accurately, for example. But then Einstein noted, it's a very long answer to a simple question, I know. Then Einstein noted, and, and, and with, with others actually, um, that something that was a, he described himself as the most audacious leap he'd ever taken. He actually wrote to a friend and said, uh, th this m suggestion may confine me to a madhouse or see me confined to a madhouse. So audacious is it? But he realized that you have a theory that tell, it tells you, if you put a sun there, a big blob of mass, it tells you what happens to space and time, how it curves. So it in, in a sense tells you the story or the history and future of a solar system, and that worked very well. So Einstein said, okay, well, therefore, could I not apply this to a universe? If I knew the matter distribution of the entire universe, would my theory tell me the history, the past, present, and future of the universe in the same way that it allows me to predict the orbit of planets, so the position of a planet at some point in the future? And it turns out that you might say, well, I can't, I can't do that. I, how can I decide to know what the distribution of matter in the universe is? So what Einstein and a, and a Belgian priest, actually, called Georges Lemaitre and some others did, was say, well, we'll make the simplest assumption which is that it's uniformly distributed on large scales. So in that direction and that direction, that direction, everywhere you look, it's roughly speaking the same. What does the theory tell me? And the theory tells you that the universe is either expanding or contracting. Um, in other words, it tells you that there was an origin, because if you've got an expanding universe today, it means it was smaller in the past. So the theory actually predicted the Big Bang, the origin of the universe. And then um, Lemaitre, uh, the, the, the priest, he was a very eloquent man, and he wrote to Einstein and said, your theory predicts there was a day without a yesterday. And Einstein wrote back to him, this goes back to the, being humble, he wasn't very humble on that day, and he said, um, he said your mathematics is excellent, but your physics is lousy. Um, because he didn't, he, Einstein was very uncomfortable initially with the idea that there was a, a beginning. He, he much preferred initially an eternal universe, but it turned out he was wrong. His theory is unstable in that respect. It, it predicts that the universe had an origin, essentially. And um, that, that, it's a remarkable story, and the reason I kind of went on that circuitous thing, but, because it, it, it tells you that you, 
that Einstein didn't begin with some grand vision of, of predicting or trying to work out with a pen and paper that the universe had an origin. He wasn't interested in cosmology, really. He was interested in the behavior. He wanted to know why things fall at the same rate in a gravitational field. And it's one of the most remarkable feats of the human intellect, but also a quite remarkable demonstration of the power of science, that thinking about that behavior leads you to a framework to speak of the origin of the universe itself Self, predicted it. About two years later, Edwin Hubble showed that the, 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 you look at galaxies, distant galaxies, and they're all receding from us. And the more distant they are, the faster they appear to be receding. And that's the signature of an expanding universe. That was two or three years after the prediction from Einstein's theory. So there's, there's the power of science and the power of abstract thought. <laughs> an experiment called LIGO. Um, and essentially what LIGO is, is a set of rulers. Um, they're laser rulers, and they're about four kilometers long. And uh, there's, there are two of the, two sites, one in Seattle, near Seattle, in Washington State in the United States, and the other one in Louisiana. So at each end of the United States, so separated by, what, 2,000 miles, I suppose. Um, and the, the rulers are at right angles to each other, and they're laser beams. So you're essentially measuring um, the changes in the distance between mirrors at right angles to each other with a four kilometer long laser beam. So very high precision measurements of, the, of changes in distances. And what Einstein's theory predicted, um, and Einstein was well aware of this, was that I said that, that mass, the, the basis of the theory is that mass curves space and time. Um, so that means that if you've got masses that move and things that happen, violent things that happen, you can get ripples in space and time that move out, just like ripples on a pond if you throw a stone into the pond. So these ripples in space and time from violent events will be passing through this room now because there have been very violent events out there in the universe. Um, but they're very, very tiny shifts. Um, I can't quite remember the number, but it's something like a, 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 a hundred thousandth of the diameter of an atomic nucleus or so. Very, very tiny shifts in these four kilometer long rulers. But you can measure it using a, a process called interference. Um, so, so, so you can measure very tiny changes in the distances. So what the measurement was, was that we realized that 1.3 billion years ago, so 1.3 billion light years away, two black holes collided. And those black holes were of order 30 times the mass of the sun each. They collided together. As Robin said, they, they, they outshone the power output of the entire universe for a fraction of a second in that collision. So a huge amount of energy. But the, the way actually you can see how much energy there was, there's a plot, a graph in the paper that LIGO released that shows these black holes. So they're orbiting around each other, um, radiating energy away through the gravitational wave, shaking up space and time as they go, and spiraling in. And there's a plot where you see the, the closing velocity of the black hole and it's measured in tenths of a second. And you see that, so, so in, in one tenth of a second, the closing velocity goes from a third the speed of light to two thirds the speed of light. So you imagine accelerating something 30 times the mass of the sun towards the other thing uh, with a change in velocity that's a third the speed of light in a tenth of a second. You realize that there's a lot of energy in that system. Incredible. And then they merge together. And you get, a, obviously, a bang and, and space-time shakes. And, and LIGO saw this signature 1.3 billion years later, which passed at the speed of light through the one, I think it went through the Seattle one first and then through the Louisiana one with the right delay. So you see the signaling one and then light travel time across the United States signaling the other one. And it's the, it's the, the signature. And so you can work out what happened. What's tremendous about it. I mean, it's also, it, first of all, it's incredible. For it, so many firsts, it's the first time we've seen black holes that large, actually. Huge, 30 times the mass of the sun. It's the first time, I mean, we, we know that they're in the center of galaxies, but this is a direct observation of them. And secondly, it's the first time we've seen them collide together. Thirdly, it's the detection of gravitational waves, which is a prediction of Einstein's theory 100 years ago. But fourthly, it opens up a new window on the universe. Because if you think about the history of astronomy, 
astronomy, going back, well, as, as far as human history, really, but with the telescope, Galileo, and all, all we've done is look at light. And light is, you can make very detailed measurements of the cosmos, uh, but you met much of the things that happen. Uh, many of them are obscured. There's a lot of dust in the universe. Uh, you can't see back beyond 380,000 years after the Big Bang, because before that time, the universe was opaque. Maybe we'll talk about that a little bit later. So you can't see back with light beyond 380,000 years after the Big Bang to the earliest times. Um, but with gravitational waves, they go through everything. They, they don't care about dust. They don't care about the fact the universe was opaque um, until quite some time after the Big Bang. They just travel. So in principle, you can, you can view, even in principle, you can view the Big Bang. You can view. You need a more sensitive set of detectors, but now we know it works. You can imagine at some point in the future, essentially using gravitational waves to probe the origin of the universe itself. So it's a, it's a remarkable discovery. But again, the probably the most remarkable thing of all is that it was predicted by Einstein uh, with a pencil, essentially, <laughs> using his brain back in 19... I think it was about 1918 or so, I can't remember, 1919. Not long after the theory was published, they noticed that gravitational waves were a prediction. Yeah, I mean, actually, we're just on our way here, we were talking about astronomy and saying it's quite difficult from the centre of Singapore, because obviously you have a light pollution problem here, which is... <laughs> but uh, you go out into the... Uh, anywhere. Um, so, so actually, south of Manchester, so we're talking about Manchester, uh, the book I've just finished with my f c colleague at Manchester, Jeff Forshaw, starts... We, we, we get to talk about all these exotic things that happen in the universe, but we start with going back to the beginnings of the discussion, actually, how do you know things? What, what can you measure? from your back garden uh, with, the, with the dark sky. And one of the things, we, we, we asked an amateur astronomer to take pictures of the planet Neptune for us with a, you know, a, a reasonable sized telescope, let's say about you know, $10,000 or something. So, so a good but not ridiculous amateur telescope. And he took photographs of the planet Neptune uh, on four nights the, the, over a month. I think it was the only four nights when it wasn't raining in Manchester. But, uh, but you, and you see it move. Uh, so it moves across the sky relative to the background, except it doesn't, of course, because Neptune's orbit is about 170 years or something like that, um, perhaps a bit longer. So, so it's, the Neptune itself is not moving very much. What, what's happening is that the Earth is moving around the sun. So what you're getting is what's called a parallax measurement. So it is exactly holding your thumb up in front of your eyes and, and, and winking like that. And you see that your thumb moves against the, the distant background. And if you really want to, and you know the distance between your eyes, you can measure the length of your arm using parallax. So it's a bit, you know, <laughs> a perverse way of doing it. In the sense, but you, you can do it. Um, and this is the same. So if you know the radius of the Earth's orbit. So you know how far the Earth has moved over a month, a twelfth of its orbit, essentially. Then you can see how far Neptune moves, and you can work out the distance to it. Um, and this is how all distance measures in astronomy are calibrated. So they're all calibrated very directly using this method of parallax. Um, there's a, there's a if you go back through history, the, the, the great challenge, the, the, the Large Hadron Collider, if you like, of the, of the um, 1600s, 1700s, those times, um, what were the, the missions that went out to try and measure the absolute distance scale in the solar system? Because you don't have to, you don't have to rely on the Earth's orbital movement to get a big... Essentially, if you think of the Earth moving six, in six monthly intervals, you get a, a head the size of the, the diameter of the Earth's orbit, essentially, so you get a big parallax measurement. But in order to, to calibrate that, uh, what you can do is measure the parallax shift in something from different places on the Earth, if you know the distance between them, which is an easier thing to know. And so throughout the sort of 17th century, very famous big expeditions went out to watch something called the transit of Venus, which was a, because it's when Venus crosses the face of the sun. And because you can measure the timings of that, you know, you can see what's happening. It's quite complicated, actually, but it was worked out, I think it was Huygens or someone, one of the great astronomers who worked out that by making those 
distance measurements from different places on the Earth's surface, you get the absolute distance measure in the solar system. And from then on, you know everything, essentially. So you knew the distance to all the planets. You can weigh the planets by looking at their moons. You can weigh the sun. It all just cascades down. Um, but then you can also do that for nearby stars. And indeed, th that was done. So you get the distance to the nearest stars. You step out again. So you say, well, what's the distance to the nearby galaxies? Until the mid-1920s, we didn't know whether there were other galaxies. We didn't know whether things like the Andromeda galaxy, these misty patches on the sky, were just gas clouds or nebula in our own galaxy. Um, it was Edwin Hubble who showed in a 1923 that, in fact, the Andromeda galaxy is a galaxy beyond our own. We now know it's two and a half million light years away. He did that ultimately by, not by parallax, because two and a half million light years is way too far to see any shift. But there was a, there's a thing called the distance ladder in astronomy, which is very clever. So it relied initially on these early measurements of the, of the Earth's radius. And then there was a... Um, a, a an astronomer, an American astronomer called Hen Henrietta Leavitt, noticed there's a particular kind of star called a Cepheid variable star, or Cepheid variable. The people pronounce it in different ways. But um, essentially, they're a star that have the property that they vary in brightness very regularly. And the period of variation of their brightness is related to their actual brightness. So once you can see these stars, and, and Levitt calibrated it by looking at these stars in the, in the Magellanic Cloud, which is a satellite gas galaxy of the Milky Way. So she knew they were all the same distance away. And she could see that they varied in brightness with different periods. And she could also see that they looked at different brightnesses. So she calibrated this a measure. Uh, so once you know how bright something is, and you know how bright it looks, you know how far away it is. And what Hubble did was find one of these in the Andromeda galaxy. And he found it, and so he knew how bright it should be, and he knew how bright it looked, and he immediately knew that the Andromeda galaxy was way beyond the Milky Way. And so you start measuring things like that. Um, the final way you do it, the, one, the, to, the, there are many other ways of doing it, but they're, they're all based on these things which are calibrated ultimately using parallax. Um, the, the ultimate way you do it for the most distant objects is using something called redshift, which goes back to Einstein's theory again. So we live in an expanding universe. Um, so that means that let's say you look at something that's um, a billion light years away. Then what you find is that the light travels to us from the thing that's a billion light years away. And the universe is expanding. So that means the light gets stretched and it gets stretched by the same amount that the universe has expanded in a billion years. So you say, well, how do you know that light is stretched? Well, you use the fingerprints of atoms. So for example, hydrogen. Hydrogen gas always glows with a very particular signature, which we can measure in the laboratory on Earth. So it gives out light of very particular wavelengths. And you see, when you look at distant galaxies, that the further away the galaxy is, the more that light is stretched, which means it's shifted towards the red bit of the spectrum, longer wavelengths. It's called redshift. And you can calibrate that and, and, and ultimately you can use that as a distance measure so ultimately you start using the so-called redshift which is the expansion of the universe itself to determine the distance to things that are you know 10 billion 12 billion light years away indeed the most distant galaxies we see with the hubble space telescope are over 13 billion light years away and i should just say one of the great projects that's um being launched the the the, the, the telescope to replace hubble in space it's called the james webb telescope and its job is to look in the very red part of the spectrum, the infrared. It's more sensitive there than Hubble. And that means that you can see objects that are even more distant because the light has been stretched by a lot. You know, the expansion of the universe over 13 billion years stretched it into the infrared part of the spectrum. But the idea is that hopefully that will be able to see the origin of the first stars and the first galaxies. It's a big open question um, about what formed first in the universe. So after the Big Bang, the universe expands and cools. At some point, things start clustering together into galaxies and stars. How, what happened first? I think the, 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 the best guess or the 
the theories, the current, the best current theories, are big stars form first, although it's quite controversial. So that's one of the things that we need to look at. But I think it's people lean now towards the idea that huge stars, very short-lived, very bright, burn, they, they collapse and burn and, and, and explode in supernova explosions. You get big black holes at their centers. And somehow that translates itself into the galaxies afterwards, so stars before galaxies. Is that true? That, that's one of the things the Webb telescope will hope to do by looking far away, which means looking right back into the distant past. The simple answer, the short answer I can give is that, that I was always interested in astronomy. And um, I've thought, because I get asked a lot, I, I've thought about what it was. And I think it was something to do with the noticing that this, you can tell the seasons change. Certainly in, 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 the, in, the, in the UK, it's a very obvious thing that happens that you, you see that the Orion in particular, the constellation, a beautiful constellation rises and, and it's a winter constellation. So it comes up as you, you're on the way towards the winter when the school year starts again in September. And it tells you, it told me anyway, that Christmas is coming or something like so the presents are coming or something. So, so so I, I think it was something to do with making a, a link between the patterns in the sky that I saw from my garden and the, the passing of the year, which I've always rather liked. I mean, it's, it's one of the pleasures of living in the, in the far north, I think, in the northern hemisphere, that you, you get these very big seasonal shifts. And so I think it's something to do with that. But then, as you said, it was uh, reinforced very heavily when I was 12 years old by Carl Sagan's Cosmos. Um, and I think that one of the things we've talked about briefly tonight, and I think Sagan, for me, was the first person I saw do this, was there's a very powerful element of polemic in Cosmos. Um, it was made in 1979. You know, the 13th episode, very famously, is about uh, the, the threat of nuclear war, which was, was felt heavily, certainly in America at that time, and particularly by people like Sagan. And Sagan managed to make the connection between the perspective that cosmology gives us and astronomy gives us. Um, very famously, his brilliant writing um, later about the, the most distant image of Earth ever taken, the pale blue dot from the Voyager spacecraft where he points out that uh, when you see the Earth from a great distance, four billion miles, it's, a sing it's less than a pixel in, the, in, in Voyager's camera. And he wrote, if I, I, many of you will have read it, but I, I recommend if you look, Pale Blue Dot, it's on, it's on the Wikipedia page if you type Pale Blue Dot. Sagan wrote of the, the, the he, he said, think of the, the rivers of blood that have been spilt over temporary ownership of a part of a pixel. And he, he translates this, this faint image into a statement about our responsibility to, to, to live together on this single point of light. And Cosmos is infused with that. And it's the idea that by understanding nature better, you can learn to live in a better way on this planet by seeing its, its physical insignificance, but its undoubted value, um, the, the fact that life is, um, well, certainly complex life is probably a rarity in the cosmos. What does that tell you? Imagine um, that in the Milky Way galaxy, we now know there are, by the way, recent measurements have told us that there are of order 20 billion Earth-like planets in the Milky Way. So perhaps one in 10 stars in the Milky Way has a rocky Earth-like planet around it. So it seems inevitable that there will be life all around there. But when you speak to biologists and you look at the history of life on Earth, you can make an argument that civilizations will be very rare. And Sagan would say, and I would say, imagine there's only one at the moment. Imagine this is the only civilization currently in the Milky Way galaxy. What does that tell us about our behavior? It should inform our politics. It should inform the way that we treat each other, the way that we behave as a global civilization. I hadn't seen that before. I hadn't seen that link made between knowledge, discovery, scientific exploration, and morality and politics, and Sagan made it. So, so uh, when you've seen that at the age of 12, you think that's what I'd like to do. I'd like to find things out. But also always remember that the discovering these things about nature tells us, it can inform us, uh, it, can, it can point us in the right direction about how we should behave. Mm -hmm.